40 years ago, a cultural phenomenon swept the world, captivating audiences with its blend of comedy, supernatural elements and cutting-edge special effects. Released in the summer of 1984, directed by Ivan Reitman and starring Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson, Ghostbusters followed the misadventures of a group of eccentric scientists turned ghost exterminators in New York City. With their proton packs and Ecto-1, the Ghostbusters became instant pop culture icons, charming audiences with their witty banter and fearless approach to battling the paranormal. From the iconic Ghostbusters theme song to memorable quotes like Who You Gonna Call and I Ain't Afraid No Ghost, the film captured the hearts and imaginations of audiences around the world. Ghostbusters wasn't just a movie, it was a phenomenon that inspired a generation. Its impact extended beyond the big screen, influencing everything from cartoons toys And of course, video games. And following the massive success of the film, Ghostbusters fever was at an all-time high. Fans wanted more, and the gaming industry answered the call. So join me as I delve into the early Ghostbusters video games, including the good, the bad, and the downright scary. Now, I've decided to start with the best Ghostbusters game, well at least in my eyes, as this was the very first game I played on a home computer. The first Ghostbusters game was for the Commodore 64 and hit shelves in October of 1984. Developed by Activision and designed by David Pitfall Crane, Ghostbusters the computer game gave players the chance to build their own ghost catching business. At the start of the game, you're given a $10,000 loan to get you started in your new Ghostbusters franchise. After choosing one of four cars, you proceed to load it up with all the necessary equipment needed to start busting ghosts. You must then navigate a map of Midtown Manhattan, keeping an eye out for ghost alarms, indicated by red flashing buildings, as well as the odd roaming spirit. After moving the No Ghosts logo to the haunted building, you then control your Ectomobile as it drives to the location, sucking up stray ghosts en route, provided you bought the ghost vacuum, that is. When the destination is reached, you take control of two Ghostbusters. The first places a ghost trap in the centre of the screen and moves to the left. The second Ghostbuster goes on the right. 
Once Slimer is roughly in the centre of the screen, pressing fire will activate the proton beams, but remember, don't cross the streams. Pressing fire again will spring the trap, and if you time it right, Slimer will be pulled into the trap. An unsuccessful capture will see Slimer fly away, after sliming one of the Ghostbusters, of course. Me. As the game progresses, the city's PK energy increases, and you must keep it under critical levels by being constantly successful at busting ghosts. Eventually, the Temple of Zool will activate, and if the PK levels are still manageable, the Ghostbusters can venture there for a final showdown with the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. Get past him and you'll be treated to a little cutscene of the Ghostbusters closing the portal to the spirit world. You also get a $5,000 reward from the city and an account number or password, so the next time you play you get to start with loads of dosh. It was then released in 1985 for other home systems, including the Atari 2600, Amstrad CPC, and ZX Spectrum. And as this version was rushed to try and get it into the shops in time for Christmas, the game didn't work with the Kempston joystick interface. Even worse, the game crashed on selecting the joystick, and as a result, thousands of copies had to be replaced with a working version. Following the success of the first game, Ghostbusters made its way onto the Nintendo Famicom in 1986 by Takuma Software, and then the game was also released by Activision in the US and Brazil in 1988 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. <laughs> The NES version is considerably different from the other versions. First off, you don't get to choose your car, and you have to actually drive to the shop in order to buy your ghostbusting equipment. On the plus side, there's more gear to choose from, including a hyperbeam to make catching ghosts easier, and an anti-ghost suit that allows you to be hit up to six times during the final encounter. Secondly, there's now a fuel gauge, so if you're not careful, you'll run out of gas and the poor Ghostbusters will have to push Ecto-1 the rest of the way. Luckily, there's a gas station at the top of the map, so make sure you keep the tank full. Ah, 
And finally, the biggest difference is the long climb to the top of the Zool building. That is notoriously difficult, so make sure you're stocked up with ghost food, the sound generator and the anti-ghost suit, all of which keeps the ghosts in the stairway at bay. Once you reach the top, it's the final battle with Gozor herself, and if you beat her, you're treated to one of the most infamous game endings ever. Now, the Master System version shares a lot of similarities with the NES version, but there are some differences. This time, like in the original games, you get to choose your car and equipment at the beginning. There's no fuel gauge, so there's no danger of running out of gas, and like in the NES version, you can visit the shop to buy more gear. The Master System version includes the Stay Puffed segment where you have to avoid being squished as you enter the Zool building. And it does have the stairway climb from the NES but this time it's a lot easier as you can now zap the ghosts en route to the top. Again, once at the Temple of Zool, you'll have to do battle with Gozor, but at least this time round she has a health bar, so you can see how much energy she has left. So the Master System version is essentially the David Crane Ghostbusters, but it's been given a facelift with a couple of extra gameplay elements at the end. Now, the only thing that bugged me about the game was the fact they spelt Gozor, Gauza, and in the manual, the key master is known as the master of the key. I mean, did the programmers even watch the film? Anyway, the next Ghostbusters game we're going to take a look at is one that I'm not really fond of. In fact, I don't really enjoy playing it at all. Maybe I'm just being too harsh and I just need to play it more and get good at it. And that is Ghostbusters on the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis. Set after the events of the first film, the Mega Drive version follows the Ghostbusters as they make their way through six levels in an attempt to piece together a mysterious stone tablet. At the start of the game you get to pick one of three Ghostbusters, each with different abilities, speed and stamina. Sadly, poor Winston isn't one of them. He isn't even featured or mentioned in the game. You then select which level you want to start on, each with four different amounts of cash reward and difficulty. And as you can see, this is a side-scrolling platform game that is completely different to the Activision Ghostbusters game. So you start off with a normal shot weapon and a few bombs, but you can upgrade to bigger and better weapons as you progress and earn more money. 
blast open safes to collect extra bombs or money bags, and keep an eye out for Slimer as he drops energy pickups when shot. Eventually, you'll face off against a mid-level boss, known as Middle Ghosts. Once you have drained their energy, it's time to trap them, just like in the movie. After the huge success of the original film, the cartoon series The Real Ghostbusters soon followed, and not long after came The Real Ghostbusters arcade game, developed by Data East in 1987. Due to licensing restrictions, it was released in Japan as Mechu Hunter G, translated as Labyrinth Hunter, and the G is just simply a reference to Ghostbusters. Throughout the 10 levels of the game, you and up to two other players control the Ghostbusters, shooting various monsters and ghosts, then zapping each spirit's soul, which is done by using your proton beam to suck in the ghost. At the end of each level, you have to defeat a boss in order to collect a key to proceed to the next stage. And keep an eye out for power-ups and other items such as Slimer who acts as a shield for a brief time. Like a lot of arcade games from the 80s, this was ported to home computers at the time, including the Commodore 64, ZX Spectrum, Amstrad CPC with this lazy Spectrum port. and the 16-bit computers, Atari ST and the Amiga seen here. Now, before we take a look at the next game, I just wanted to clear something up. Something that's been on my mind since 1984. And that is, why is the Ghostbusters logo reversed in some countries? I mean, which is the correct way round? Well, let me explain. 
Michael C. Gross created the No Ghosts logo, improving upon Dan Aykroyd's initial idea. The logo was based on the no signs in Europe, where the diagonal bar goes from top left to bottom right. One of the versions he did had the word Ghostbusters written on the diagonal bar, and he thought it didn't look right, so he flipped it. It was then decided to remove the wording from the logo altogether, but they just left it flipped. So when the movie was released in Europe, the logo stayed the way it was originally, and that is what people in Europe were used to. So there you go, the backwards version is the one you see in the film and in the US and the correct way around is this version. Now this is the logo I'm more familiar with as this was on all the merchandise when I was growing up so I do prefer this version. Now back to the games and the final one we're going to take a look at is from the 1989 sequel Ghostbusters 2. Published by Activision and developed by UK software house Forcefield, including programmers Andrew and Philip Oliver of Dizzy fame, Ghostbusters 2 contains three levels based on key scenes from the film. In the first level, the Ghostbusters need to collect a slime sample from the Van Horn subway tunnel. Ray Stance is lowered into the shaft on a cable in order to collect the sample at the bottom. On the way down, you encounter many different types of ghosts, some of which try to saw your cable and others deplete your courage upon touching Ray. You can keep them at bay with proton beams, bombs or use a shield so they can't harm you. Extra bombs, shields, energy for your proton beam and elixirs that restore courage can be found on ledges in the shaft and can be reached by swinging over and touching them with your feet. But the most important items that need to be collected on your descent are the parts of the slime scoop and container in order to collect the slime. The second level sees the Ghostbusters in the Statue of Liberty walking down Broadway to the Museum of Art. The statue automatically walks to the right and you can use her torch to shoot at the many enemy ghosts in her way. Her slime supply drains constantly, however defeated ghosts drop slime, which can be collected by sending out the little people at Liberty's feet to pick it up and return it, so the supply can be refilled. But watch out, don't allow them to be caught by the zombies on the road. This level plays like a side-scrolling shoot-em-up and has a few mid-level bosses along the way. And you can see how far you have to go till you get to the museum with the distance indicator at the bottom of the screen. In the third and final level, you need to confront Vigo the Carpathian in the museum and save Dana Barrett's baby Oscar. First, all four of the Ghostbusters have to be lowered into the museum on ropes and you control their descent by moving the joystick up and down.
During the fight, you can switch between the four guys at any time, and the goal is to defeat Janosch by shooting him with a slime blower, carry baby Oscar to safety, and finally defeat Vigo with two of your Ghostbusters proton beams. If you manage to succeed, it's game over and you're treated to a rendition of Old Lang Syne. And with copies of the full price game, you even got a free badge and a balloon for the kids. And believe it or not, Ghostbusters 2 even got a release on the Atari 2600. The Atari version was developed in 1989 and was ultimately shelved due to the declining popularity of the platform. However, in 1992, British game company Salou decided to release the game in Europe, even though Atari had already ended support for the system. And unlike the other computer ports, this version only has the first two levels. And well, all I can say is at least they tried. I doubt they sold many copies, but who knows? Maybe if I take this, bury it in the sand for a thousand years, it'll become priceless. Nah. So there we have it, the first Ghostbusters games from the 80s and the early 90s. And I know there are others that I haven't covered in this video, such as the two Ghostbusters games on the NES and the various Game Boy games, but I just wanted to focus on the games that I enjoyed playing back in the day and have fond memories of. And with Ghostbusters Frozen Empire being released this month, the franchise will capture the hearts of a new generation of fans. Anyway, Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Ah, ah!